All right, <clears throat> we are picking up uh, with Alfred on page 122 in Salt of the Sea. And we have followed the journey of this group of people. They are now um, getting ready to cross the lagoon. And we open up with Alfred writing another letter in his mind to Hanalore, right? And he talks about meeting up with the printer. We also get facts about the ship. So whenever Alfred is mentioning something about the ship, something about Guslov, or something about the port city, those are going to be facts. That's not his memory. That's how the author is sliding the historic facts into us. So we want to pay attention when that's being done. Okay. Uh, and of course, this is the cathedral um, that they end up spending the night in, and they're going to cross this lagoon. They have to wait till night for it to freeze. Now it's getting, it's dropping way below freezing at night, and it's most likely below freezing during the day, but the ice can't freeze solid enough for people to cross it. You know, people with wagons, with horses. Um, you're not talking about just one skater out on the ice. And then they're going to go on that small strip of land. Okay, so that is where they're heading towards. And so um, Florian starts to mention um, next chapter on 124 through 126 about what he's going for, right? Why is he there? And he's talking about the Amber Room. So the Amber Room was a real room. It was in the Catherine Palace in St. Petersburg. It was actually a gift from a Prussian king. So there's a connection again that we're seeing with Florian. It was stolen by the Nazis after the siege on St. Petersburg in 1941. They box it up. They take it to the castle of Königsberg in Germany. Now, Konigsberg is going to get brutally damaged during the war. And there's still, this is one of history's mysteries, is what happened to the Amber Room. It was considered one of the wonders of the world. And <clears throat> Konigsberg was completely damaged. I have an image I'll show you here in a moment. It was completely damaged during World War II. So some historians say that the Amber Room was destroyed, that it was put in safekeeping in Konigsberg, but Konigsberg was so damaged that the Amber Room was destroyed also. Other people say no, that the Nazis went ahead and boxed it up, and there are witnesses, there's been several investigations, and some witnesses say that it, the boxes were put aboard the Wilhelm Gustav that we're reading about. Um, another thing to mind as we're reading this story is that amber is considered Lithuanian gold. The Baltic Sea is going to churn up amber and it comes up on the shores of Lithuania. And so amber is fossilized sap from trees and sometimes it has animal insects inside it. But it is considered Lithuanian gold. So Lithuania is it's sort of like the gem of Lithuania. Okay, and so to show you, this is a reconstruction of the Amber Room. So uh, the Soviet government rebuilt the Amber Room. So this is a reconstruction. You can go tour the Catherine Palace and see it. This is their best construction of what it was. So these were panels that were on the wall, and the panels were all taken down and carted away by the Nazis. This is what Konigsberg and Konigsberg Castle look like following the battle in Konigsberg. So you can see why many people say if the Amber Room, the panels were boxed up and they were held here, they were most likely destroyed. And there were some people who were sent to search and investigate following World War II, and they said they saw remains of it. So again, it's an interesting mystery of history. And there's some people who are still chasing the panels of the original Amber Room today. And when we get to pages 167, 168, Florian's actually going to ask Joanna about her amber necklace. Remember, Joanna is from Lithuania. So the author does a wonderful job of connecting this and bringing the story of the amber room into this story. So again, it's hard if you don't know the background to separate what's fact and what's fiction. And so there is 
written evidence that there's some truth that the Amber Room was on the Wilhelm Gustav. We don't know because the ship is considered a sacred site and um, the Polish government doesn't allow exploration of it. And so as we read about uh, Florian, we find out that Florian has the key. And it says, the key was my revenge. But the tiny crate with the swan was more important. It held my revenge against Hitler. So we're starting to get some clues. And then Florian, we start to see the character of who he is. He wants revenge against Hitler, right? Um, there's that Prussian culture, that sense of family, that sense of who you are coming out in this part of the story. Right, so the shoe poet uh, wakes Amelia. And we hear him telling her, let's get across this lagoon. You know, if it was summer, I'd swim across this. This is miles across. Um, he's an older man. So is he saying this or is he saying this? Because if you think of it, watch how the shoe poet has sort of become the guardian, the guider, the leader of this band of refugees. Okay, he's the one who's sort of like the father. He gathers them up, right? Um, and Amelia is worried. Um, she's always watching, right? It talks about her observation skills and how she learned that from her mother. And then on the last section there on page 128, right? Amelia says, I felt so no one knew my secrets except maybe the ravens that nested above the cold cellar. And the cold cellar is where the root vegetables were kept on the farm that she was sent to in East Prussia. Right, where her father sent her to for safety. And notice again, birds. So whenever we're reading about Amelia, birds are going to come in. They're a symbol that are associated with her. Of course, ravens, usually not associated with something that's light and kind. Ravens are usually associated more with foreboding and something ominous, like a, a shadow over something. Okay. And then we go to Joanna and Ingrid. All right. And then in from on 129 to 132 joanna's talking about notice that second chance comes up a lot remember guilt is her hunter and so when you think of joanna think about what guilt is hunting her right with amelia what shame is hunting her All right now that he says that they have to have space between the group and again this would be true so they're saying 50 meters between each group that's a little bit more than half an American football field. That's about 70 yards. Okay. And then there's personification as we read about Ingrid crossing and the group crossing it says the rest of our group advanced slowly, carefully, yet desperate to move quickly across the jaws of ice. All right. There's some personification there. And then of course we lose Ingrid um, in a terrible way. And not because of the ice so much, but again, because of the advancing Russian uh, Soviet army. All right. And then Florian starts in with a secret again. Right. Um, and there's a moment there where Amelia brings Florian and Joanna together. And then, of course, we get Alfred. Now, Alfred, if you notice, as you start to read this, the writer does a lot with Alfred's words. There's a lot of alliteration, a coveted pieces of paper that will allow passage. There's also the rhythm in there, right? Coveted pieces of paper that will allow passage. So there's a rhythm to the writing with Alfred and certain things that he says. And we also have alliteration where we hear that sound. So we have pieces of paper, right? Passage. And then we also have S, right? Um, so we have the S in passage and stack and passes and posterity, right? Soothe the strain of my absence. And then we have the P's, right? Passes, posterity, passage, right? So focus on that. And here's another one on page 135. I pity the man who cannot overcome his cowardice, who cannot, right? And so we see cannot, cowardice, cannot, and there's a lot to be said if well much of what alfred says you might not really care to read 
but there's something that the author does to help us stay focused as we read his words, right? And he talks about um, on 123, he says that the Gustav only had 12 lifeboats. The other 10 were missing, which tells us there should have been 22. What again is the author foreshadowing, All right? Not enough lifeboats. And then Alfred wonders if Hanelore has a number, because he has a number. He says, brave men are reduced to numbers. These numbers are engraved twice on his dog tasks, right? And he gives his number, I am 42089. I couldn't help but wonder, did Hanelore have a number? What is he talking about? What is the reference there? What's the foreshadowing that we're getting from the author? All right. As we go back to them crossing the ice, there's a lot of personification with the ice. The ice ached and groaned on 137 with Amelia, like old bones carrying too many years, brittle and threatening to snap at any moment. The ice is arthritic, but no fractures yet, says the shoe poet. We have kilometers to go, kilometers to go. Now, when I read that phrase and that wording, it reminds me of the poem by Robert Frost stopping on a woods and on a snowy evening and the end part is and i have miles to go before i sleep miles to go before i sleep and a lot of people reference the end of that poem as talking about i have a lot to do before i die and as i read this i'm making that connection in the chapter with amelia on 137 we have kilometers to go kilometers to go Right. And then, of course, Amelia has a lot of memory, and really the memories are what she has left, right? She has nothing. She talks about all she had left was this rotten potato to gnaw on. There's nothing left. All she has is what she carries with her. We know she's pregnant. And then she also tells us she doesn't know how to swim. So there's a secret there, okay? And, of course, Joanna is just feeling horrible about what happens to Ingrid. And we notice that there's the poets trying to bring humor into the situation, right? I mean, this is a terrible, it can't get any worse. I, I don't know how, well, this, the story, the, what the people are going through has to be some of the worst things the people go through. And then Florian says of Eva, she didn't move. Her big feet grew roots. She didn't move to save anyone. And the poet says, feet with roots? That's called a fungal infection. And so there's some levity. There's some humor there. Um, and that's the nature. But again, we're seeing the character of the poet. He's trying to guide everyone. He's trying to help them as a caretaker, as a custodian, a father figure, grandfather figure. Right? Um, and then Florian has to go through the different checkpoints. And he mentions about how this is Koch's private business, which was very, very common. A lot of the German officials took artwork for themselves. They were supposed to be taking it for the nation. Um, and then we find out they're going to Gotenhafen, right? And then we're back to Alfred. And again, he's talking about one thing to note on 145, he says, this is a most important assignment. We're going to be commanding 2,000 people. 2,000? You think this tub's only going to carry 2,000 people? Who told you that? Right? So again, whenever we're looking at Alfred and think about how others respond to him, it's also telling us that there's going to be way more than 2,000 people on that ship. And as we get to 146, the, here's the theme of fate. At the start of the chapter with Amelia, right, it says, I watched Jeffrey Jews cross the ice and can use the trek down the narrow strip of land between the lagoon and Baltic Sea. To the left, well, your left, to the left, Gotenhafen, to the right, Palau. Either journey, the one would be another long one. Our group argued, but finally chose Gotenhafen. There's fate. There's choices. They decided to go left instead of right. 
right? And their life is forever changed because of that decision. And then they're talking about how they're going to get where they're going, right? And then Florian and the nurse, Joanna, right? She's using guilt on him. You owe us. You owe us, right? Joanna wasn't allowed to save Ingrid or tried to save Ingrid. Florine owes them something. So while Joanna understands guilt perfectly well, she's also seeing how to use that guilt. Now, dear Alfred, right? He's talking, he's thinking back. Um, first of all, he has some agency, right? He marks one of the toilets as inoperable so he can hide in it, right? Um, and he says, some at home didn't appreciate me. They saw me as a birdie with a troubled wing that should remain close to the nest. They didn't know the truth. And so we're going to get a clue on who this person was. Who is a they who saw him as a little bird with a troubled wing? Because I don't know that I would refer to him as a little birdie, right? Because I think of something as precious, a little birdie I want to save. Do I want to save Alfred? I don't know that I do. Okay. And again, we get that alliteration. War is full of duty and decision. Right. And then he, of course, is talking about himself. He saves the bathroom for himself. And he says, life can be lonely for truly exceptional. I build my own nest and feather it with thoughts of you. So as we look at Joanna's chapter 152 to 154, how does the writer show us the chaos, right? We are at Gotenhofen and they've come off of that small boat. They've arrived at the port city. How does the author use the words that she chooses to show us instead of t telling us that it was just a mess there, okay? And so this chapter is really good at doing that. And again, we see the poet organizing, saying we're going to stay at the clock, right? Um, is clock part of the theme? All right. And then we get to Amelia. And so we're going to talk about Amelia's night. So there is a Polish legend. Um, in Poland, there's some beautiful, beautiful mountains. And there's a legend that the Polish knights sleep in the caverns in the mountains in Poland. And that they sleep until they're needed. And when they're needed by someone in Poland in distress, they will rise to the occasion and come out. Other than that, they sleep. And so when Amelia talks about the night, there's a direct connection here with her culture, with who she is. He is the night, Florian is, who's going to come save Amelia, this Polish girl. So it's no mistake or coincidence that the author has had her name him as a knight, right? To slay dragons. And then she talks about her mother. And Amelia says she was like a tiny boat in an angry ocean. And some boats just flew, floated away because moms are your anchor. And so because she doesn't have that mother to anchor her, she's just going with the flow. She's just going where she can. She's truly lost. She truly feels alone. And so it says, I force my mind to our happy thoughts. And with each step, the truth grew closer. I could not make it much longer. She knows she's getting ready to the point where she's going to have to deliver her child. And so she's lost. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her. She's alone. How will she raise a child? How will she care for a child? All right. And again, as we go to Florian on 157, there's a lot of facts here that we can pull out about how people were allowed to board the ships, the order that they were going to be put in. This plan of Operation Hannibal had been written down for quite a while. And so people were alerted when the evacuation was going to happen. And so if you were a German party official, if you were a family member of an official, you had priority boarding. Uh, officers and wounded would also be granted passage. And we're going to read about uh, ambulance train that's going to come with wounded, right? Um, and of course, there's a little bit of talk about 
Florian and how he needs Joanna and how does he need Joanna? Does he need her just as a passage on there or is there something more that he needs? And of course, at this point in the book, we are getting a true understanding of the character of Alfred, right? Um, and pay attention to how the other sailors talk to Frick. How do the other officers and other people talk to him? How does Florian see him based on his uniform? And what is his reaction? Um, you know, when he talks about, oh, yeah, those terrible wounded who aren't going to make it, the brown cabbage in the basket. Like when you go and you choose produce, you want to get the best produce to take home, right? Because it's going to last longer. You don't get the produce that's going to go bad quick. It makes no sense to save a head with only a few good leaves. And he's referring to these German soldiers who have been seriously wounded, mortally wounded, as nothing more than cabbage heads. And so even though many of us, and rightfully so, view the Nazi military as committing terrible, terrible crimes, we still see that among them, they're individual people with decisions of who they choose to be, right? Um, and then we start to see, um, moving forward, the poet, and he's starting to use his skills, right? He finds some boots and he trades them for some money or a bowl of porridge. And so there is survival, the theme of survival. There's also the theme of agency, right? and willpower to find a way. And again, the poet is with a sense of community. Everything he does is for the others. Everything he does is not for himself, right? It is always for others. Um, you know, here we have Alfred. He doesn't open up a letter from his mother for two months. Um, and then on page 166, Alfred says, don't touch my butterflies. Please don't go in my room. And I know nothing of the Jaegers. The Jaegers? Hanalore is Hanalor Jaeger. And so how is this fitting in with what we understand about Alfred? What new questions, what thoughts are there, right? And so his mother's talking about, um, which side that you're on, right? Um, and is it his mother who thinks of him as a little birdie and is protecting him, right? Um, and so we also find out that Florian is more injured than just the side piece. Um, on 171, Joanna mentions again about her guilt, right? Um, with Alfred, again, on 172, we have that alliteration at the start of it. It says, but my boat, the Willie G, as we Navy men call her, as we Navy men call her, is a real mackerel amidst the minnows. So mackerel are big fish, um, well liked um, in Europe to eat. Uh, so again, there's that alliteration. And in the middle paragraph, we see they were so arrogant and aggressive. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? And then notice Alfred, he talks about meeting the Hitler youth that come to his door and he talks to them. And then it says, I noticed that you promptly left your kitchen and walked toward the foyer when they came knocking. I still wonder, why did you move so quickly? We cannot be too cautious. So again, there's this c cautious, right? Just because someone knocks on the door doesn't mean you have to open it. Sometimes, sweet girl, there are wolves at the door. If we are not careful, they might eat us. So again, a little bit of foreshadowing about Hannah War. Uh, there's quite a bit. And on 175, our refugee group meets Alfred Fr Frick. So finally, all the characters are going to be in one spot at the dock in Gutenhaven, right? Uh, and of course, Florian has a conversation 
with Alfred, and we definitely see the differences between those two men, right? He says, this guy was a first-class booby. He's a jerk, you know? He's a jerk among jerks. Uh, and then on 178, Alfred said, the fates of fortune had found me. So again, there's that alliteration with Alfred, okay? And it goes down and says, she pulled out her papers, pulled and papers, right? So as you read Alfred, if for nothing else, go through and see the writer's craft of alliteration. Um, he's, I believe, to me, quite annoying to read, but he is there. And then on 181, Joanna actually has some alliteration. And the second to last paragraph it says, the train battered like a bruised fighter, right? So we have battered and bruised, but this is also a simile. The train was as battered as a bruised fighter. So the train was fighting to get those wounded soldiers to this port, right? Um, and so it's him, uh, a good simile there. Uh And so we go on and then we leave with Amelia wondering if she's going to be left. And then we see, then she says, I revisited the truth on 183. Martin Kleist welcomed me. Elsa Kleist welcomed me. August Kleist truly welcomed me. But Erna Kleist, she did not welcome me ever. And we even see that the father says, when he's having a question, a conversation with Mr. Kleist, will she be welcome? And he hesitates, right? Um, and so Florian tells us that literally hundreds of thousands have descended upon Gutenhaven from the deaths of East Prussia and the Baltic countries. They now pushed and floated like human driftwood near the harbor. So again, the author does a great job of showing us if we were watching the scene from afar, what is this going to look like if you were looking down on this port city? Right. And so Alfred brings out his packet of passages, right? His tickets that he took from the printer. And he says, of course, taken only as mementos. And so again, there's fate, right? It was fate that Alfred would see the printer and fate that Alfred would take the passes. There's fate that they're going to meet up together and Florian is going to be able to see through the kind of person that Alfred is and pretty much use him, right? Um, and then when Alfred is being approached and talked about Amelia that she is her papers say she's Latvian so she doesn't speak German and Alfred says yes many share your handicap right so he is truly believing in that Nazi ideal of better people and again look at the contrast of who is Alfred and who is he saying are the better people he considers him one of those better people how does history view those, right? Um, and he even talks about the group and he says, despite her tears, she was Aryan, a fine specimen of the master race. So again, we see where Alfred's ideals are lying, right? So he says, she could be saved. Yes, Hanalore, amidst the grips of war, the beast of man emerges to conquer ever lurking infidel inside my sword is drawn death to the man who tries to harm this dulcinea so dulcinea is a fictional princess from the classic story don quixote and don quixote believes he's a knight and so all knights must have a lady right that's chivalry and so not only do they have a lady but she would be the most exceptional lady in the village. She would be beautiful. In fact, dulce means sweet. 
And so as you read this, think back, what does Alfred refer to as Hanalore so often? He refers to as my sweetness, dear sweet Hanalore, right? And so here is another woman that he is going to protect. And he names her as Dulcina, right? And so he meets the group and he says, ah, the nurse, right? And then he's looking at Amelia and he's there to protect her. So that's where we end on 188. All right, and here we follow the passage of our group from the barn to the roadside to the Prussian manor house to Fraunberg. And now they're in Gotenhofen and they're hoping to board the ship.